Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's try that. Let's try that again. I'll project. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is the second Wednesday of the month. So it must be another installment of the What Matters to Me and Why series. <laughs> on behalf of the Advisory Council on Climate, Culture, and Inclusion, I want to warmly welcome you to this special occasion that brings together the campus community, students, staff, faculty, and the wider Irvine community. My name is Doug Haynes, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of History, and I stand before you as the chair of the organizing committee of this series. Today is the sixth of seven installments of this series. It's been in existence for three years. Previous presenters this year include Elizabeth Loftus, Natalie Schoenfeld, Arthur Lander, David Reichenmayer, and Mark Warshire. The purpose of this series is to build and sustain bonds between members of the campus and to foster understanding about how each of us in our own ways embrace UCI values. These values are respect, intellectual curiosity, integrity, commitment, empathy, appreciation, and my favorite, fun. In this spirit, and we do have a tradition here. Let's take a minute or two to greet your neighbor in front of you and to your side and behind you. too far. <laughs> program to Rebecca Thompson, who will introduce our speaker, I just want to provide some additional remarks. The first is a plug for an, another program that the Chancellor's Advisory Council on Culture, Climate, and Inclusion is sponsoring on May 5th, and that is the Anteater Equity Games. And that is scheduled uh, on Tuesday, May 5th from 11.30 to 1 p.m., and it's in its second year. And the purpose is somewhat unusual, but I think consistent with what we're doing today. It's to bring faculty, students, and staff together to learn and play and have fun together by completing a set of challenges and fun games. I just want to remind you that the deadline to register is April 16th. Uh, this year, we want to increase the size of participation and so most of you should have in front of you a flyer that describes the games. And again, it's open to everyone, staff, students, and faculty. And we hope to get all these different constituencies working and playing and having fun together. This program that we're here today, uh, What Matters to Me and Why, would not be possible were it not for a large number of people, and I want to take this time to acknowledge them, because it takes not a village, but like many things at the university, a committee. <laughs> and the committee for the uh, What Matters to Me and Why uh, include the co-chair Jonathan Fang, John Stupar, our graduate student representatives Daniel Quang and Rebecca Thompson, uh, as well as our undergraduate representative, Mira Rosales. And please give them a hand for their hard work. And as a good teacher should, before I leave the podium, I want to leave you with five things to keep in mind. First, 
Speak up during the question and answer session. We want to ensure that your voices will be recorded. And if you're uncomfortable with being recorded, please take a seat and retire towards the back. Second, complete the audience survey, which will be available after today's talk. We do appreciate your insights and comments, and from these surveys, we actually get nominations for future speakers. Third, discard your lunch boxes. We want to be good neighbors in the School of Humanities. Four, our next event and our final installment is scheduled for Wednesday, May 20th with Julia Lupton. And finally, please register for the Editor Games. We want to see you out there on a beautiful day. And without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rebecca Thompson. Like Doug said, my name is Rebecca Thompson. I'm a third year doctoral student in psychology and social behavior. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Michelle Goodwin from the UCI School of Law. She received her JD from Boston College Law School and her LLM from the University of Wisconsin. She is now, as you can see, the Chancellor's Chair and the Director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy where her research focuses on the role of the law in the promotion and regulation of medicine, science, and biotechnology. She's been an outspoken advocate for civil liberties and human rights, especially on issues of human trafficking for sex, labor, body parts, and marriage. She's also the president of the Defense for Children uh, International U.S. affiliate, as well as the founder of the Institute for Global Child Advocacy. Her academic success and strength of conviction make her an excellent role model for emerging female academics such as myself. And so, without further ado, let's give her a warm welcome, to Professor Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor and pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was so very generous, and I want to thank you to uh, Doug and also the committee that selected me to participate and be with you this afternoon and my colleagues who are here today from the School of Law and more broadly throughout the university community. So this talk, in the spirit of what matters to me and why, is not fully academic uh, because what matters to me and why is not necessarily fully academic, but it stems from values and commitments that were, uh, that were nurtured within me uh, from birth on. And so we may not get through all of my slides uh, at all. And, uh, and if we don't, there are just some core principles that I would leave you with that have really guided my life and that have shaped the relationships that I've had. Uh, and the first of them happens to be perseverance. Uh, this was something that was inculcated in me by my grandparents. I get weepy even thinking about it. Uh, accountability which is interesting because it's a term that became hijacked uh, by conservative groups in the 1980s and 90s, but I remember it from my childhood with my grandmother uh, who grew up in Mississippi and everything was about accountability uh, and also integrity, right? You know, you have to walk with your accountability and you have to walk with your integrity. And then finally, <laughs> dignity. And there's so much more too than just those principles. But I think it's really quite remarkable to imagine in this country that there were people who were once slaves who then uh, became some of the leaders in this country, uh, truly helped to make our Constitution real and stand up for its values. And so with that, I'd like to begin, and let's see if our PowerPoint is actually going to work here with this mouse. All right, quilt. There we go. So I start with quilts. Uh, there's the quilt that happens to be pinkish and the quilt that happens to be blue. And uh, that's on my balcony. I planted lemon and lime trees, so I'm really proud of that. But these quilts uh, were stitched by hand by my maternal grandmother. And they mean a lot to me because the one in blue was the last thing that she did, the last quilt she ever did before she died. We had no idea that she was dying, that she had ovarian cancer. And I had asked her for a quilt. You know, I want another quilt. And she did it. And she finished that quilt on Thanksgiving, and she passed away 
uh, the February after, February 9th, right, 25 years ago. And the quilt that's sort of pinkish, and let's see, uh, as a close-up, there's that pink quilt. Well, the pink quilt was one that she did uh, shortly after my birth. And it was restored by a friend of mine who's an artist that I met who is also from Mississippi. And she's a folk artist. And the quilt had been tattered over the years. And I wasn't going to just leave this quilt with anybody to restore. So for years, I carried this tattered quilt literally all around the world. I lived in Italy. I've gone everywhere. And this quilt came with me. And so finally, uh, a couple years ago, a friend, Dorothy Johnson, fabulous artist in her own right, I, I gave her the quilt to restore. And I said, Dorothy, do with it what you will. I just want to bring peace back to my grandmother's quilt. And what she found inside the quilt were my baby clothes that my grandmother had held on to and that she had put inside of the quilt. And that was really, really beautiful because I came from a family of a parents of who, who were nomadic in quality, which meant that they really didn't hold on to uh, much of anything with regards to my childhood. And so these quilts really uh, ended up making a, a difference in that one. Uh, here's a picture of me from when I was small with my maternal grandmother who stitched the quilt. Now, the only embarrassing part about this picture is that clearly I have a wedgie or something in that picture is I'm like one and a half, you know. And those were the days where they did not believe in diapers after a year and a half, you know, not like these kids who were like four and still in diapers. You know, they, they reminded me that I was potty trained at nine months old, which I find surprising. How in the world does that happen? But they were like serious kind of people back in the day. Um, and... Uh, my grandmother, she really embodied those principles that I start off, started off with the breaking voice about. And she also embodied courage for me, too, um, quite significantly. Um, uh, two stories uh, that I remember that really frame uh, my grandmother so well. One, she was one of these church-going women. She had moved from the south up to the north with her husband, who had been in the Air Force. And, um, and my grandmother did a, engaged in a practice that I didn't realize till later, which was her own version of an underground railroad. So there were lots of people that she called Aunt so-and-so. That's Aunt Bernice, and that's Aunt Mary, and that's Aunt so-and-so. Little did I know they were not related to us at all. Neither were their children, all these new cousins. But my grandmother helped women who had been victims of domestic violence or who had otherwise fallen on hard times, were part of the immigration trail coming up from Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, and whatnot, and were settling into the Midwest and needed a safe place to stay. And her very large home became that. When I was small, my parents lived in Montreal, and I spent my first few years living between both sets of grandparents who were in Wisconsin. And so all of this family that she quilted for me um, and for them were people who were really on their hard time, but I never knew it, right? It's because she really cared also about people's dignity. She never exposed their vulnerability to anybody. She's also one of those people who really did, they, in her obituary, they called her a saint, you know, um, because she really was one of those very prayerful kinds of people, a uh, kind of woman that didn't drink, didn't smoke, all of that. But I remember something quite distinctly when I was small, because in the city in which she lived, Milwaukee, there was incredible racialized tension. It was not unusual for police to engage in the kind of brutality that we have seen in the last year that has been on camera. Only in those days, it was not caught on camera. In fact, my grandmother, um, her youngest son was still at home at the time, and she had a 6 p.m. curfew for him. And it was 6 p.m. He was a great kid, ended up being, you know, going off to the military and was a football player in college, all of that. But she wanted to ensure his survival. And ensuring a young black boy's survival in Milwaukee at the time meant that he had a 6 p.m. curfew, even if he was a great student and did all sorts of wonderful things. But two moments that really capture for me um, both her integrity and also her courage was one day there was a rapid knock on the door. She opened the door, and I was always right by her side. And when she opened the door, there was this very panic-stricken-looking young black man. 
And she very quickly closed the door, and she did like this to me, which was the signal for shh, you know, that, that universal signal. And she put him in a closet. All of this was happening so fast in front of me, and all I knew was that, you know, it was the show which, and it came from my grandmother, which means just shut up. And it was like she predicted what was going to happen, because next there was another banging on the door, and it was police. And the police were looking for this person who was in the closet. And my grandmother refused to surrender him. She said she had not seen him and he was not there. And then they looked at me, and I remember the shh, and so I just stood there, you know. <laughs> and it was something that I never forgot, that was never lost on me, and that came back to me later in life about just what that moment meant for her in terms of her own courage and conviction that she was not turning over this young black man. I don't know what he had done. But she had a whole different view of the world, a broader sense of the world. Another incident that I remember was one in which uh, there were other people outside the doors. Like her house was a bit of a fortress. And she was outside and on the porch. And I was just so curious. I wanted to get out there with her on that porch. And I remember out there, uh, I did sneak out. And she saw me, but it was. A mass. Now, it may have been only about 20 or 30 people out there, but to me it seemed like a whole thick, deep community of people led by some angry men. And it was, my grandmother couldn't turn away from the crowd, and so she just sort of put her hand down towards me, and I could barely raise up above the railing. And I remember just this angry crowd at her. They wanted this woman who was inside, and my grandmother was not going to surrender the woman inside. And I remember the head of the crowd being so angry, and perhaps this was his wife, and he took off his shoe and he threw it at her. But what I found so amazing is that she didn't flinch. She didn't move. She was unmovable in protecting her house and the people who were in her house. And I think that's really quite amazing. Now, this is a very difficult picture to see because it's broken up and I've never gotten it restored. But that's a picture of me with my mother when I was small. Uh, and that's about the only one that we'll ever see. <laughs> um, and here's another one of me with my maternal grandmother. There I am trying to feed somebody. I don't know who that person is that I'm trying to feed, but clearly I'm trying to be a helper. And this is my paternal grandmother, who also lived in the same city. And so for my few, first few years, my life was really defined between both sets of grandparents and these two women. Uh, one who was the church mother of her community, my maternal grandmother, who really set a tone for all that went on in the community and had weekly meetings where it was really the board of directors. The first board of directors that I ever saw was the one that my grandmother chaired at her dining room table. Uh, and it was really quite powerful because they were the ones Though not lawyers and doctors, they truly were the people who ran the community and they were the people who went to court to stand up for people. On the other hand, this is my other grandmother who took me to the ballet um, and to ice capades and all of those kinds of things to make sure I was a well-rounded and cultured person. Uh, there's the, my other grandmother. And here's a picture where we're, both, we're all in shock at something happening. And it would be typical of my paternal grandmother uh, to be in shock and have dismay about somebody <laughs> acting out. And clearly, the look on her face is that some child at my birthday party <laughs> has acted out. And because this translated, you know, this was back in the days where you could say, you cannot act like a fool, right? <laughs> African American people in the room will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and where you just get the eye and that you know with the eye you better get in shape. And so clearly my grandmother was very unhappy with something that was going on um, at that time. All right, fast forward a bit. And I figure in this instance, you all want to see what people look like at a different time. That's what I looked like at a different time. I was about 16 uh, years old there. But those values that I had from when I was young really shaped all that would come later. I became an emancipated minor when I was 16 years old. I left home when I was 15. In the time in between, I shifted between two different parents, both who had their own um, ways of living life, and finally, by the age of 15, I figured that I had a very different uh, way of, that I wanted to live my life. All right, 
fast forward even further, and this will all end up coming home. This is my husband, Gregory Schaefer and I. Someone decided to put us on the cover of their book. And it's a book about interracial relationships that came out a couple years ago. It was a book that's authored by uh, a colleague in the field, Professor Angela Unwichy uh, Willig. And it was a book that tells actually a very tragic story that actually says a whole lot about where integrity can be found and how people persevere or how they don't. Is the story of the Rhinelander couple, which is actually a very fascinating story worth your looking up. It's a story about a couple that during Jim Crow, he was white, she was black, uh, fell in love. Uh, he came from a very well-to-do family, and his family did not want the two of them to be together at all, and so did everything possible to try to break up the union, including uh, seeking that the marriage be annulled and claiming that there had been some form of fraud involved in the relationship because uh, the claim was that the husband did not know that the wife was black. Now the tragedy, I know, I know. Well, this matter goes to court and a New York court hears the case and the case becomes even more tragic and says a lot about race in the United States at the time because the court forces the black woman to strip naked in the court before the jurors, oh yes girlfriend, in the court for the jurors. Uh, and the reason why is that they want to see how dark uh, her breasts are and her nipples, so that they can determine whether or not he should have known when she was nude uh, that she truly was black. Uh, the jurors decide that, uh, the all white male jury decide that yes, he should have known uh, that she was black uh, by the color of her body, her naked body, and therefore uh, they do not allow the marriage to be uh, annulled, but the father of the uh, husband um, later pushes for a divorce and the, hu and the husband agrees. The husband ends up dying um, very early in age and uh, his wife outlives him but they're never together after that court suit. Fortunately, my husband and I have a very different kind of legacy going on <laughs> and it's not that. But it does strike a chord about these issues of accountability and integrity and how we live out our relationships um, really do matter. So there we are, my husband and I, on the day that we got married and there's Reverend Jesse Jackson who married us. All right. And family, because the whole quilting idea, what's behind a quilt, is that you're bringing different pieces together. And so this is an image of my family, a family that uh, is all brought together. In fact, there's a story that I'll share with you about our bringing together because my husband and I, for both for us, this is a second marriage for both, and before we actually really knew each other, our children met, or shall I say, I brought our children together in meeting in a very um, uh, surreptitious, it, it, well, it wasn't surreptitious, it was just um, something that was not to be predicted and that later came to blossom. And that is that it was at the University of Wisconsin uh, I was doing a fellowship and doing my LLM there and was the assistant dean. He had just joined the faculty there. There was uh, an emeritus dean who is still on the faculty who for some reason kept hosting these dinner parties and inviting me and saying that he really wanted me to meet Gregory Schaefer. And I said, why? I don't know. And he said, well, you're both tall and you both write poetry. That was not <laughs> sufficient for me. I, I was doing work. I had things to do. Um, but one day in the faculty lounge, uh, there was a little boy who was sitting there who was about 12, 13 years old. And I said, who are you and who do you belong to? And he said, that is what I said. Who are you and who do you belong to? And he said, I'm Brooke Schaefer and I belong to Gregory Schaefer. And I said, well, this is Sage and she belongs to me and I need for you to watch her for just 10 minutes while I do some photocopying. And so Brooke sat on one end of the table and Sage sat on the other end of the table, Brooke reading and Sage playing with some plastic animals. And then I gathered Sage and I thanked Brooke and who would have thought that uh, we would have been, that we became a family uh, some time later after that. And that Brooke was actually instrumental in that because he then told his dad, hey, there's this woman that we should invite over for dinner. <laughs> who would have thought? how things happen, you know? 
And then families quilt even more. This is a picture where we're joined by Steve and Patricia Blessman and their son, Ben, who happens to be our godson. And to talk about how the world keeps unfolding, Patricia and I came to know each other, but did not know that Greg and Steve grew up together spending summers together uh, in Michigan. And then the world comes together, it continues to quilt. We're the godparents to this now seven-year-old boy, and he comes and spends summers with us, and we spend our Thanksgivings together. To go on a little bit of a flashback here, again with pictures, you'll see me in that uh, left-hand corner. Now I have to say, this is one of those things where universities at the time, this was true of my university, we didn't have a whole lot of diversity, so they held on to pictures that they would later reuse, <laughs> recirculate um, to show diversity, because I had long graduated <laughs> from the institution by the time that they had put that picture together. That was the University of Wisconsin, where I attended as an undergraduate and was president of its student government. But where the quilt begins to get thicker is that during my time as an undergraduate, I majored in sociology, anthropology, and African languages and literature. And I was very much interested in the patterns of how people move throughout the world. In particular, I was interested in African immigration into European countries. At the time, there were folks that told me there was no such thing, right? Africans were simply starving in Africa. Africa was treated as a country rather than a continent with dozens of countries. Uh, and that there was no there there. Well, I had a sort of different view, which is that Africans, of course, as we know here in the United States, but also Brazil, other parts of the country, had moved throughout the world. And in the late 1980s, early 90s, there was significant movement into European countries. And so I left the United States to study this uh, in Europe. This is the Joel Nufuma Refugee Center, which is where I was a volunteer at. And my work in international law really began to spring up there. I was not yet in law school, but it was the plight of so many people uh, who were coming through the refugee center that really resonated with me. These were people that we were not really um, taking, in, taking into account in the United States in academic discourse. At the time, uh, trafficking still was not an issue that was really being written about at all. And I began to write about trafficking, the trafficking for labor, uh, the trafficking in women. Here I am with a group of women in the Stazioni Termini in Rome. And one day a week, all of the uh, women who were um, not documented laborers living in Italy would go to the Stazioni Termini, the train terminal, and that was their day off. And there I was on one of their days off with the women. And I would interview them. I would go to the soup kitchens. I volunteered at the refugee center, collecting their narratives and stories, the kinds of stories that in the United States we said didn't exist because there was famine in Ethiopia, and that was the end of the story. Right, um, But I knew that there was more to the story than that. And so that's some of my early days of research capturing um, the way in which people were living. And it really did matter to me because it resonated with my childhood, right? People who have a story who are trying to get from one place to the other and trying to do so in a safe and healthy way. Uh, and trying to do so in a way that provides them some form of sanctuary. One of the things that really bothered me that got me back to the United States was that how difficult it was for people coming from various African countries to get sanctuary anywhere. And it was truly uh, ironic but um, also warm that in Italy, a country that had signed treaties saying that it would not allow um, immigration in from select countries, yet really took an open embrace and charitable organizations really came uh, to the aid of so many people who were flocking in. But what was so tragic is that many of these people were being duped by lawyers and people who posed as lawyers in the United States who would ask for them to send hundreds if not thousands of dollars to them and then promising that they would uh, help these people to get green cards and they wouldn't. And that really bothered me and that is actually what drove me to, inspired me to go to law school 
there's one of the people that um, I was helping at the refugee center. Mind you, all of these things are happening while I was about 20 years old, <laughs> 20, 21 years old. Now, fast forward even more, uh, and this takes you up to uh, some work that I've been involved with more recently. Um, and these are pictures from India. My work has involved sex trafficking work, looking at labor trafficking, looking at organ trafficking. Here I'm looking at marriage trafficking uh, in India. And I call it a form of trafficking because it's important to unpack that marriage does not legitimize forced rape, forced sex, forced marriage of young women. And it's an area that, that uh, hasn't really been addressed at the federal level until recently, where we've begun to pay some attention to the fact that forced underage marriage is a form of trafficking, and that marriage simply isn't a cover for it. And girls as young as these in this picture being forced into marriage. In my research, I've interviewed girls who are 14, 15 years old on their second marriage because the first husband has died and now they've been married off again. It's, you know, I, I find that these issues that I come to in my research continue to, to resurface over and over again. So the space of 25 years in between being at the Joel Nafuma Refugee Center and taking into account those stories, um, really not a whole lot different than looking at what's happening in the world today when I go to uh, Johannesburg or Cape Town or when I'm in the Philippines or when I happen to be in Bihar in India. And I think the faces on uh, these girls really help to tell a story about what their lives are like. They can't help but think that part of what motivates me happens to be what was inculcated in me when I was a child with my grandparents. All right, now, as I move through the second half uh, and speed up a little bit, um, here's a picture of Nina Freelon. And you might wonder, what in the world does a jazz singer have to do with Michelle Goodwin's life? And why is this slide here? Well, I attended a concert uh, that was hosted, actually, by a very good friend who happens to be my daughter's godfather. And he would arrange these jazz musicians to come into the University of Kentucky. And one of them in this picture is Nina Freelon, the woman who is in black. I'm standing next to her in the white. And after the concert, Nina and I, along with a friend of mine, Professor Serena Williams, who is the woman that's on the other end of the photo, we went out to dinner with her. And she's a jazz musician that's traveled all over the world and whatnot, and for a period of time was living in North Carolina. And I asked, what was that like? Because it was for marriage. Um, her husband got a job in North Carolina. And she had to move to North Carolina, and I thought, gee whiz, that must be awful for a jazz singer to go from Paris and many other places to North Carolina. And she said her mother-in-law told her when she was complaining one day that, Nina, you need to blossom where you're planted. Now, any student who's taken any course with me has heard that very saying, and friends too because she said it worked out brilliantly for her. Instead of thinking when she was in North Carolina that she needed to be someplace else, instead she focused on what was there and around her. She began to teach kids to sing in schools. Uh, she got involved in the nightclub scene there. All of these things that hadn't been a prior part of her career. And it was so absolutely fulfilling. And she didn't lose a beat with it. But there was something that resonated so powerfully in that narrative for me that we all should blossom where we're planted. You know, people spend so much time thinking about where the grass is greener someplace else, that they could be driving some different car, that they could be in a different house, that they could even be with a different family, right? But not appreciating what is actually there in the moment for them. And I thought that was so incredibly profound that, um, that I've held that uh, with me uh, since I met her, and that was a over about 20 years ago, actually. And something else happened about 20 years ago. All right, and that's this person. This is Sage. This is my daughter. Um, she's now a student uh, in Palo Alto at Stanford. And I just love that picture of her, that big fro, her little doll. Uh, just great. I grew up an only child. I'm an only child. And so what was very important for me when she was born uh, was that she would have a uh, family in case something ever happened to her parents, to me or her dad. Uh, and so 
I sent out a prayer, and I'm not the woman that my grandmother was. I don't go to church all night and all day. I don't go on Sundays. And so I was really sort of shaky about sending out this prayer, you know, wondering what the universe listened to me because what have I put in that prayer basket? But I did send out a prayer, and I was very fervent and committed in that prayer. And the prayer was that she would have aunts, that she would have aunties. Because for me, it mattered so much. As an only child, the best parts of my early growing up was the time when uh, my grandparents moved, my grand maternal grandmother moved back south once my parents came back from Montreal. And so I would go travel down south to visit with her, Memphis and Mississippi, and see the aunts. They mattered so much, and I would spend time with each of the aunts. It was really, really powerful. So I wanted my daughter to have aunts. And the funny thing is that prayers can be answered. And it was like three disciples showed up within a matter of six months. Seriously. Um, one of them, Anne, right here. Um, Anne's father was the pastor of the 16th Street Baptist Church. For some of you, that will resonate. That's the church where four black girls were blown up through an act of terrorism here in the United States. Uh, Anne, a very committed civil rights uh, activist, uh, actually called me on the phone, saw me in the newspaper and called me on the phone, and it was an immediate click between Anne and her family uh, and me. My daughter was about six months. My girlfriend Nancy, and there's her daughter Casey, uh, Nancy too, within just weeks of me sending out that prayer, um, appeared uh, in my life. There's a third person, and I only have a picture of her, and her name is, is Todd. Um, and there's Miss Sage. The beauty of being able to have wonderful aunts is that you get to have such peace on your face like that. Um, it also can mean that when you have lots of aunts, your identity is very full. Until she was about six years old, she actually thought she was Jewish. Uh, and she would tell people uh, that she was. Um, uh, I remember getting her her menorah, her first menorah, which she had asked me for. So I said, OK, uh, you know, every Jewish child needs their menorah. Uh, I'm not going to disabuse her of this. I believe in free identity. And I remember my daughter uh, uh, critiquing me because I got her a dancing menorah, feeling that, you know, as a kid she would like that. You know, you've seen those menorahs that look dancing. And, and she was concerned that I wasn't being uh, reverent enough uh, because she wanted one with uh, pillars, just solid pillars like that. Um, Nancy was one for sending me cards, um, cards that often shaded the black and the white. Um, and this was very sweet, and there's so much more that I could say. I could do a presentation just fully um, on that. But I show you this picture um, with Nancy's daughters and with Sage because Nancy died. It will be 10 years uh, come next year. And I tell you that it is very hard for me to talk about her without being tearful. I'm surprised that I'm actually able to do that today. But this is a picture from uh, the baby shower for one of her daughters, and it meant so much. Um, she died from breast cancer. My grandmother died from ovarian cancer. So something else that matters a whole lot to me happens to be that involving health, uh, because so many very important women to me in my life have passed away from cancer. Uh, with my grandmother with ovarian, Nancy with breast cancer, and a couple of other women uh, with breast cancer who mattered a whole lot to me. And so in my life in the last few years, I've been the fill-in for Nancy at both girls' weddings. Their mother was not able to attend. And so I stood in at both of the baby showers. I hosted uh, the baby showers for them. Right? That's just another picture of Sage. But like any good aunt, because for me it was not just important that my daughter have aunts, but it's been important for me to pay it forward. And so this is a picture paying it forward with my girlfriend's daughters. This is a, You can see uh, Anne's two daughters, and you can see one of Nancy's daughters. And what I've taken them to here is something that's totally common today, but at the time was a huge deal. And it was a gay pride parade in Rome. Um, and this must have been the, what, early 2000s. Uh, it was, or not even. 
this may have been 1997 or 1998, uh, the Pope was against it. And you can imagine, you know, today we talk about gay pride and gay marriage, but at the time, this was being uh, something totally counter-cultural, -cult but this is what an aunt does, right? <laughs> uh, and that is what uh, I did. There are pictures of the girls, and there's one of uh, Emily there. Uh, and of course, uh, when you're countercultural, you have a child that grows up also countercultural and goes from, you know, being Jewish uh, to liking belly dancing and <laughs> wanting that kind of celebration on uh, her birthday. But you also end up st stitching an even bigger quilt. Uh, and in this uh, bigger quilt here, you see a picture of my family, but also a young woman from China. Um, and who went by the name of Amy, but her real name was Ming Yu, and she lived with us for two years uh, in Minneapolis. As some people will say, you know, my house is, is a, somewhat of a version of what my grandmother's house uh, was, and so people come through, and sometimes people stay a while, and she stayed for two years. <laughs> And the picture of the kids right there. I don't know that they would be happy of you seeing this picture, right? <laughs> one with braces and one uh, in college. But as I wrap up, I'll wrap up with just pictures of my family, me and my son and my daughter. And I'll conclude with that one of my daughter who's now at Stanford and that's her first day of school. And so all of these, uh, all of these, the people that you see in the images, the stories behind them all matter to me. There's so much more to each of these folks and all of this, but I'm happy to share this snippet with you today. Thank you. Uh, Professor Goodman has agreed to answer questions. Please don't be shy. We have microphones on your right side and also on our left side. Please speak up so we can all hear you and record you. Let me repeat that. This is your time. <laughs> As what to say after all of that. But we can have whatever conversation that you wish. Hi. My name is Emily Chen. I work at the, uh, I'm working at a financial analyst. Uh, I hope that I will, uh, this is my first time asking a question. I have so many, many questions in my brain, but I don't know which one to choose. But for now, I really am interested as uh, you, not only as a minority, also as a female in your field, I want to know how do you, what challenges that you were facing and how did you handle them? And how did you go through all your frustration with difficulty and accomplish what you Thank you so much for that question. It's a great question. Um, so part of this question is one that women encounter men too. How do we create some sort of balance in our lives? But then there's a deeper question that relates to people of color and women of color. How do we um, engage and how do we thrive in territories and spaces where we still are new? Where for many of us who are teaching, for our students at the undergraduate level and even at the professional graduate level where the, it's the first time that they have ever encountered a woman of color teaching them at all. And sometimes uh, there can be challenges with this. I mean, I can say that unfortunately there are still barriers. I've been in rooms where there are barriers to people of color who are very, very talented being hired. I've heard the excuses. I've heard such strange excuses about people of color being hired. She's too skinny. Like seriously, did we not look at her record? This is the best that we have. We can't hire her because she's too thin. Um, and, and so many others. But I would say that perseverance really does matter. Accountability really does matter. Stitching a quilt and finding people not only inside one's institution, but also outside of one's institution can be a lifesaver. When one thinks that, you know, or questioning the quality of the work that you're doing, it's helpful to have people that are not just simply within your institution, but also outside of your institution evaluating that, uh, evaluating your work. And also people 
that you can simply talk to. So for me, I recognized early on that relationships really do matter, and building relationships with good people really does matter. And, uh, and that just fits with our title, doesn't it? Thank you so much. There's such richness in what you shared. I'm really grateful for you being here. Thank you. And I have a question about, I do life skills training with young people. So I have a question about your way, way back, the emancipated 16 year old. Yes. And so what, could you talk a little bit about what were the dynamics of being resilient and finding your place and overcoming fear and dealing with kind of just the day to day of what that might feel like. I feel like there are kids on this campus who feel like they're emancipated and they have no idea how to deal with that. Sure, uh, another brilliant question. So organization really does matter a whole lot. Um, when I left home and then became emancipated, first I was somewhat naive because uh, I grew up when I was in New York, I was with my father and when I was uh, in the Midwest, I was with my mother. And these two people really did not like each other. We lasted as for one year as a family, the year that I was about four or five years old, and then they split apart. Uh, and so I had one name when I was with one side of the family. Uh, my mother was Goodwin Bratcher with my father. Two very different things. But when I settled in New York, moved back to New York on my own, and I literally had a plane ticket and $10 in my pocket, and I decided I was going to do it all on my own. Uh, both parents did not want me to do that, uh, but I figured I did not want to be bought and be a part of uh, their realities. And I was naive because I had uh, attended prep schools. I had had a privileged uh, academic life. So I thought, you know, in New York, anything goes. If you want to register to go to a school in New York City, they, they take anybody. Little did I know, no, that doesn't happen. You know, my sense of the public school world is that you just show up and they're just so happy that you showed up, that they're not going to ask questions. Um, no, that wasn't the case at all. Um, and that actually began the legal part of my leaving home because the school actually called and said, where are parents? He's like, parents, I, I live by myself and here is why. And very quickly a social worker was calling and law was involved. Uh, <laughs> little did I know, eh? that was my first real legal encounters. Um, but um, organization really did matter. I was very focused and I knew what I wanted. I knew an education was very important that no matter what, I had to keep my eyes on that prize. And so I was a very good student. I was captain of my debate team. I was on my volleyball team, on the tennis team, and all of those. So I, I continued to do many of the good things that preceded my leaving home. Um, and meditation really did matter. And I meditated every night. I will have to say that Stevie Wonder and Elton John got me through, because uh, that was essential. <laughs> Uh, to my meditation. And I'll also say that uh, something else that's really been important to me has been good teachers and professors that have really made a difference. Um, I had a really terrific uh, debate team coach, Carol Wagner, really believed in our team. There is a lot that I learned about discrimination when I left home and was at a public school. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. We were in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and we were quarterfinalists. And the Lincoln-Douglas debates are very big. It's the big deal New York debate. Uh, and we were the scrappy public school team. And we knew that we had beat out this very fancy New York public school team, Bronx Science. We knew we had beaten them, and Bronx Science is the big deal. And we found out that we had lost, and we wondered why. And you don't get your scores back right away. You get them back, you know, weeks later. And when we open up the scores, here's what we found, and it taught me a whole lot about the way in which the world works. We had outscored them, as the judges judged us, without scoring them, without scoring the other team. But they still gave it to the other team, right? And that taught me a whole lot about how name matters, right? You know, we were the kids on Staten Island at this public school. They were the kids from this different kind of school. But it's important to hold one's head up and keep one's dignity intact. In 
even uh, notwithstanding that. So great teachers matter, and then I will also say that great professors also matter. Um, I became very close to my professors, um, and they really, truly became like family uh, to me. It made a difference. Um, I, I have a good question. So you worked, I saw in the first slide, you worked in the Center for Biotechnology, and that makes yes sense considering your experience with cancer. And I was wondering if you work closely with bi biologists, biological researchers? I do. I, I work across the, the board, and, and I have students who also come from the biosciences as well. I have a case book um, on biotechnology, bioethics, uh, and the law, and I engage in the broader aspects of uh, research that engages not only trafficking but organ transplantation gives you one highlighted example. My first book was actually in that domain called Black Markets, the Supply and Demand of Body Parts. But there too, professors really make a difference because uh, when I was in law school, my first semester, and law students aren't supposed to be hired first year, first semester, but uh, there was an ad uh, professor, a bioethicist, looking for a research assistant, and I responded to it. And little did I know, he was incredibly famous, uh, famous Jesuit bioethicist John Paris. And I asked him, why should I work for him? And you know, and I think about this now, he reminds me of this, of me asking him why I should work for him. I just thought it would be a smart question to ask. <laughs> he hired me anyway. Uh, <laughs> And a wonderful story is that on my biotechnology casebook, he's one of the co-authors, and the other co-author is one of my former students. And so it's, again, it's another quilting experience. And we just saw each other, in fact, uh, at Stanford. We had dinner, uh, my husband, Greg Schaefer, myself, uh, Sage, our daughter, and Father Paris. We re very recently had dinner. And so maintaining those relationships. And I have to say, uh, one of the sadder parts of this is to see some of them um, age and, and die uh, away. Jim Jones, who's at the University of Wisconsin, recently died. And he was certainly instrumental in me going to law school. So hi, Michelle. Hi, Beth. I, I, I hesitate to ask this question, because it's such a shallow question. Um, and you've already gotten some really deep questions. And maybe it's a question that only one woman can ask another. But um, when did you go from the big hair? It's a great question. It? Yes, there is a story behind it. I love it. I love Beth. And she's my colleague. She's wonderful. I attended uh, your talk here, and I absolutely loved it. It was a brilliant, brilliant talk. So the big hair, there's a story behind that. So I did have big hair, and I had long hair. And in fact, I had, uh, I had dreadlocks. Uh, and they were really quite beautiful. People would you know, try to sneak up behind me and touch my hair and, you know, be at the shop, you know, which is also an interesting race thing, too, you know, you to touch your hair. Um, and it, <laughs> there are folks who are laughing, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but the summer that my daughter, she was born in January, January 7th, and by the time of that summer, and I was going to be moving south uh, to Kentucky, I was hot. I mean, not hot as in beautiful, but you know, just you know, it was just it was just hot. You know, it's just you know the heat and everything. And I had this long hair, um, and I I just wanted it off. And the one thing that I worried about was what it would mean for my daughter. I felt I felt badly for my daughter. Like, what will my daughter think? I mean, she was four or five months old, you know. But I was I was concerned about that. Would would it change something in our relationship? Um, but I cut it off, and then I continued to cut it shorter and shorter. So I, I cut it, and it was uh, you know two or three inches longer than this. Uh, but then I continued to cut it. And there is a second part of the story, which is a story that also is a, a woman's story, which is that I wanted to find a place where I could get my hair done. Because going from having this long dreadlock hair, which you basically just do your hair, except there are now places that are really into doing dreadlocks. 
But um, I thought, okay, this is time where I can like go to get someone to do my hair. But the thing is, the people who would cut hair, because there would be women who were really upset, you shouldn't have short hair, you should have long hair. So I couldn't go to the women. And I didn't go to the guys, the barbers, okay, just cut my hair. But they thought it was like a, 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 like a canvas, you know, time to, to do funny shapes and things, so to put their initials in the back of my head in places that I couldn't see. And I thought, no, this is crazy. And so the, the other part of the woman's story is that I then got clippers myself. And I, and I asked some guy, I said, well, who does yours? And he was a guy doing my hair, trying to put his initials in it. And he said he did his own. And so I said, I, if you can do it, I can do it too. And so for the last 20 years, I've cut my own hair. Wow. Yeah, so how about that? Yeah, <laughs> how about that for girl power? <laughs> Taking it on home. Uh, colleagues and friends, we have time for one or two more questions. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, so I have a question. Um, thank you for the great talk. It's really great. I'm really appreciative of all the words that have come from your mouth. Um, but my question for you is, how have you really like embraced what Nina Freeland had told you to uh, blossom where you were planted like, mm -hmm. through your life decisions, through other experiences that you've had? Thank you for that question. You guys asked the best questions <laughs> ever. Well, it, you know, it's, it's meant that, it, I'll give you one example uh, that I'm far enough away from now to talk about. Um, in my first job, and I have a colleague uh, here in the audience, Song Richardson, we both taught at DePaul University College of Law. And in my first semester there, uh, we had a series of unfortunate circumstances uh, that occurred. One included uh, the stepping down of the dean, who was the first woman uh, dean of the law school, uh, who had been the dean that hired me. She passed away within about a year of that. Um, also within that uh, same year, we had some pretty heady, um, some pretty heating circumstances of sexual harassment faculty to students in, in one specific case. Well, that was very, very difficult because I was the person who flagged it. Uh, and it was very difficult because um, it wasn't a situation that went away easily. Uh, it was a situation where at a very public event I had a male colleague grab a female student and put his mouth on her without her consent. And what unfolded, I, would, I could not have anticipated at all after going to the dean, which is that I had a male colleague who would target me daily in the email saying very horrible things about me and that I must not have seen what I saw. And yet it was a room full of people who saw what I saw. But it was also at a time where these things could happen. Right, where, you know, where women are not supposed to speak up about sexual harassment uh, and where it's permissible for people to be adamant deniers um, in that kind of way and to be quite vicious about it. And I had to make a decision about whether or not I would stay at that institution or whether or not I would leave. And this was actually, the, the result of that was a combination of not just thinking about blossoming where you're planted, but also thinking about what my grandmother had told me too, right? As she stood her ground on her porch and in thinking about would I be the one to leave my institution, no one was asking me to leave, but I thought, would I really want to stay after being harassed there myself? And I thought, I'm going to stand my ground. Of course I'm going to stay. And it meant that the colleague who was involved in that harassment really sort of shriveled away to the background. A new dean was hired who was a fabulous dean that was responsible for hiring some really, really terrific people. There are other examples that I could share with you about blossoming where you're planted, but that one was really quite profound because in staying past that first semester of mine there, I wrote great books there. I put on wonderful conferences there. I developed great scholarship. I was on our faculty appointments committee and was responsible, contributed to the hiring of some really, really terrific people there um, and really blossomed uh, there. And so I think that it can happen. I know that it does happen. And there are other examples that I could share um, and would be happy to talk with you uh, about it after. Well, please, let's thank uh, Professor Goodman.